the next number of weeks, um, what I want to do is to kind of talk to you uh, on a subject that I have called this, this kind of series that I'm probably going to call that I have called I Pressed On or I Press On. In Philippians chapter 3, um, Paul is writing to the church in Philippi, and uh, in chapter 3, he, he writes this, the, these words. He says, forgetting what is behind, anytime now, forgetting what is behind, I strain forward and straining forward to what is ahead. In verse 14, he starts, he says, I press on. He starts and he says that there's this one thing that I do, this, this one thing that I do. I'm going to forget what has happened in the past, and I'm going to press on. I'm going to press on. I'm going to press on. Sometimes in, in, in life, you know, especially when, when it comes to Christianity, the people coming to church and that there is that, is that very often people kind of struggle with Christianity. They, they struggle with being a Christian. Anybody can testify to that where you have struggled being a Christian, where you have maybe even struggled to come out to church on Sunday, maybe because it's either easier just to watch online, or you're just going through stuff, and it's easier not to come to church than what it is to come to church. It's easier to take a step back than what it is to take a step forward. Am I the only one that has been living that life? No, can you? Yeah, you're with me. Five or six are. Five or six are being honest. The rest of you are just lying. Um, but but it's, it, it can be so, so difficult to be a Christian and to follow on and to follow through. And so many times we just want to give up. And sometimes people ask the question, okay, what, what am I going to do? And can you pray for me? And this, this, that, and the other. And we do all that there. We believe in prayer. But sometimes it just comes down to the fact of I'm pressing on. That's it. I'm pressing on. I'm going to be here on Sunday regardless. I'm going to be here on Tuesday night praying regardless. I am pressing on. I'm pressing on in prayer. I'm pressing on in worship. I'm pressing on in my study of God's Word. I'm pressing on. Paul says there's one thing that I do. One thing. Forget what has happened and press on towards what is ahead. God has got a plan and a purpose. He's got a road marked out and mapped out for you. And the only way that you're going to reach that and achieve that is by pressing on, by pressing on. I think that, you know, one of the things that I, I kind of feel is, is a part of, of my calling um, th that I do. Probably whenever I preach more, more than anything, I preach on subjects of growing and developing and walking out your faith in Jesus Christ. Because for me, that's sometimes what I find. In fact, a lot of times, 99% of the time, if you want to know what your calling is, what your specific calling is then that, that God has called you to, then look at what you've been through in life. And so for me, a part of my testimony has been that as a teenager, struggling with identity and purpose and in growing in God. So for me, it's like it's seeing people develop in their walk with God. So a lot of times whenever I preach, I preach on stuff that talks about growing and developing in Jesus Christ and in God and maturing and growing in Him. That's a part of, of, our, uh, of our vision statement, of our mission statement, um, that all would be saved and come to full maturity of faith in Jesus Christ. This place would not be big enough we could knock down that wall behind us there, go into the sports hall that's behind there. This whole center would not be big enough to hold everybody who has made a commitment of faith to Jesus Christ in New Life City Church. If they were all still here, this place wouldn't be big enough to hold them. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus tells a story, a parable of the sewer. Of, of, a, of a farmer who was sowing seed, and he talks about how some seed fell on the path, some on the rocky road, some got uh, choked up by the thorns, and some grew to maturity. And sometimes what you have happen, unfortunately, in Christian life is that some people, whenever they become a Christian, they, they don't develop the, the roots that is required to grow, or they get choked up by the things of the world, and it takes a hold of them. But not everybody comes to this point of full maturity of faith in Jesus Christ and grows in the way that that seed grew that Jesus talked about in that parable. And so one of our desires is not just to see people get saved, but to see people become disciples and grow and mature in their faith in Jesus Christ. But how do we do that? 
Whenever we're faced with so many struggles, for a lot of people, it's just like one fight after another, one battle after another, and it's like you don't even get, you don't even get time just to develop your faith to mature. It's just like you're just fighting constantly battle after battle after battle after battle. What do you do when you don't know what to do? What do you do when you don't know what to do? Sometimes that's, that's what happens in life. It's like we're faced with something and like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And Paul says, I press on. And I want to encourage you today to press on. Specifically today, I want to talk about trust, about pressing on in trust. Because what has to happen is we've got to trust God with everything that we're going through. You don't know what to do? Press on and trust. Take it to Him. Take it to God. In Proverbs chapter 3, we read these words. It says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, and don't lean on your own understanding, and in all of your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding, and all of your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. Trusting is probably like the most important lesson that we could ever learn in life, certainly in Christian life, the most important lesson that you could learn. But I would say it's probably the most difficult lesson to learn. Do you ever find sometimes that life just looks blurry? You remember like the old days whenever um, you used to have the cameras, David, you don't have your, your phone, you, know, you didn't have phone back in the day. You know, it was a camera and you had the, um, the wee reel that was put into the camera. You closed the camera up and then you took the photo and you hadn't a clue what it was going to look like. You just, you just didn't know until all of the photos were done, you know, it's just like you were taking random photos of random things just to use up the, whatever it was, was it 36 exposures you got? Let's just take up the last few so we can take it down to Boots Chemist and get it all developed. And then you waited a couple of days and then you went and you picked up your photographs, whereas nowadays everything is on a phone. So you take your photograph and you're able to look at it, and if it's not good enough, delete that, let's take another one. And sometimes we take a photograph and it's just blurry. Anybody, you know, think I've got, I've got one here, and there's this photograph, and it's just a blur. Do you want me to go up and do that, Matt? Are you okay? <laughs> Whose fault is it, Matt's or Maggie's? There's going to be a divorce here before there's even a wedding. <laughs> Sometimes life is like this, where it's just blurry, where there's no clarity, where there's no definition, where you're in a place where I don't know what to do with this. I can't see clarity. I can't see any definition. I can't make out any longer the image of my life. Maybe at one point, life was going great. Everything was all in order. Everything was all in place. Everything was all conditioned. It had shape. It had form. It had definition, it had clarity, and life was good. And at some point in time, this is where it takes you, to a place of, of blurriness, where you can no longer make anything out, where what was clear is no longer clear. What do you do whenever you get to a stage like that? As a Christian, what do you do whenever you get to a stage like that? Because let's be honest, how many times do people become Christians where life was good before you became a Christian, but it's like ever since you became a Christian, it's like one thing after another. I talk to people like that, and it's like my life was actually better before I was a Christian. Whenever I say better, I mean more kind of organized, but it's like whenever you become a Christian, there's like more attacks. So it's like living a Christian life, yes, it's a better life, but there seems to be a lot more blurriness now. So what do we do? Can I encourage you that if this is your life right now, number one, that you press on, number two, that you trust. I press on. And I press on with trust. Christianity is a faith. 
we, we, we have this trust in Jesus Christ, this faith in Jesus Christ that He is the Son of God, that He is who He said He was, that He, he died on a cross, and that He rose again from the dead, that He ascended into heaven, and that one day He will return to this earth again for His bride, for His church. So, so there's an element of, of faith, an element of trust in who Jesus was and who He said He was and who He, he is in Him being the Son of God. But what happens whenever this is, becomes our life? Do we still have the trust in that, in Jesus saying who He said He was? Do we still have the trust in Him to bring us through this moment of blurriness? There's this moment where Jesus is with His disciples and Thomas isn't there. And his disciples, they, they're talking, the ones that seen Jesus, they, they go to Thomas and they like, Thomas, he's alive, I've seen him. And Thomas is struggling with this because the disciples struggled with the fact that Jesus was alive. They're questioning that he, he's alive. Why, why is the tomb empty? And, and they've got all these questions and Thomas doesn't see Jesus. All the disciples are saying to Thomas, no, we've seen him. And Thomas' response is, well, unless I see him for myself and touch him, and I'm not going to believe and then there's this moment where they're together again. Jesus appears in the room, walks up to Thomas. Thomas gets to touch him in the side, to touch him where the nails pierced him. And at that moment, Thomas believes. And Jesus says to him, you're blessed, Thomas, because you've seen and believed. But how much more will those be blessed who haven't seen and yet still believe. That's us, that we haven't seen, yet we believe. You are blessed here, Christian, because you haven't seen Jesus, yet you still believe. You carry that trust. But what do we do? Whenever we need a breakthrough, but it seems like a breakthrough isn't coming, what do we do whenever we need God to intervene, but it seems like He's distant? What do we do when we need, we, we need God to, to hear us, but it seems like His ears are closed to us. What do we do whenever we need God to speak to us, but it seems like He is silent? What do we do whenever you want Him to see you, to see the situation that you're going through, but it seems like His eyes are closed or like He's turning the other way and He can't see you or He refuses to see and refuses to speak? What do we do whenever we really want God to come so close, but it seems like He is so far away? What do we do? whenever we're going through moments like that because I know that a lot of you are going through that right now. That's where this sermon kind of comes from. Having spoke with many people that share their stories with me. I could spend hours talking about individuals and the stories, not just in this place, but messages I got during the week of people who have ended up here, Christians, Christians whose life has become blurred. Well, what do we do? And this is the moment when we need God to be so close. But yet sometimes He seems and feels so distant. I want to encourage you today, church, press on and trust. Press on and trust. You see, trust requires that we give complete control over to someone else. You ever had someone say to you, trust me? Trust me? How many people regretted that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> trust me. But whenever someone says, trust me, what they're actually saying is, I know the whole picture. I know the whole situation. I know the whole issue. I know where we're going. And you don't know anything. So they're saying to you, trust me. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to take place. You don't know where you're going. You don't know the situation. They know it all. So it's easy for them to say, trust me. And you know nothing. So you're giving the whole situation over to this other person so that you have got absolutely no control whatsoever. 
You ever see people do the trust falls? <clears throat> I don't know if maybe you've had to do it in work or something like that there, or, you know, as a youth pastor, whenever I was a youth pastor in this church, every youth pastor has probably done the trust fall with their kids. If you haven't done a trust fall with your kids as a youth pastor, then you're not a proper youth pastor. And so we were teaching the, the, the kids about, about trust, or I was teaching the kids about trust. I'll never forget this till the day I die. And uh, we were around a top house and had a couple of kids, up at the, you know, a number of them, and we were all doing, doing the trust fall. Um, William, I don't know if you were there at this, if you remember, if you remember this or not, um, but we had a couple on, on the, some of them standing on the platform, and I'm glad they were on the platform because that one centimeter of, of carpet cushioned the blow. And uh, so this one kid is going to catch the other kid, you know, and they're, they're all doing it. But for some reason, it, this was not intentional in any way, shape, or form. It's one of those things where timing is just perfect because the kid that was going to catch this other kid, I came in through the door and I called him to get his attention. I didn't know. I didn't. I'm just like, I called him and he turned to at this. At that moment, the kid in the front, eyes closed, falling back, hits the floor and it wasn't the Holy Spirit. And then you see these other people, and it's like, you know, in, in work or whatever, they're with their friends, and they're going to do a trust fall. In a trust fall, you f cross over your arms, you close your eyes, and you fall backwards. That's the rule, you fall backwards. And I've seen these people, and they're there, and they're ready to fall, and their friend, they've got their eyes closed, their friends gather around to catch them, and they fall forwards, <laughs> flat on their face. They deserve a broken nose for being so stupid. But in that trust fall, you have got no control of the situation. You're giving all of the control over to the people that are there to catch you. They have got the control of everything. They decide and they choose whether to catch you or not. That's the purpose of the trust fall. Do you trust them enough to catch you? Do you trust them enough to hold on to you? Do, you? do you trust them enough not to let you fall, not to let you come to harm? Do you trust God enough to catch you? Do you trust God enough to hold you? Do you trust God enough to take control of the situation of whatever it is you're going through? Do you trust Him enough with the process? Do you trust him? Proverbs chapter 3 says, trust in him with all of your heart. So that means giving all of the control over to God. Giving everything over to him. We have this tendency to take a little bit of control. We, we have this tendency in a trust fall to look back. And that glance is enough to say, I don't trust you. Peter is out with some of the disciples. They're on the boat, and storm comes. Jesus walks on water towards them in the Sea of Galilee. They think it's a ghost, and they discover that it's Jesus. And Peter says, if it is you, Lord, then call me out onto the water. And Jesus says, he invites him out to walk on water, to walk on the Sea of Galilee with him. And Peter steps out of the boat and walks on water towards Jesus. What a miracle. What a thing to happen to you. We know the story of how that as he's walking on water, Peter trusts Jesus with the situation. He's giving control over to Jesus. But then waves start to come up and wind starts to swell up. And Peter takes his eyes off Jesus and begins to focus on the waves. Having walked on water, he is distracted by something that makes things blurry. And he begins to sink in the water. And there are people who, you know, because we talk about, but you've got to get out of the boat. And a lot of people have gotten out of the boat. A lot of people in this place, you have gotten out of the boat. You have been, spiritually speaking, walking on water. You've been walking with Jesus. But for whatever reason, you've been distracted. Waves have come up. Things in life have happened that have caused you to be distracted, to lose focus. And I want to tell you today, let's get our focus back on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Let's get our eyes focused back on Him. And let's start to rise up again, to begin to walk on water again, 
to begin to walk hand in hand with Jesus again, to get that trust back again. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about faith, because faith and hope and trust, I think, all kind of go hand in hand. And, and the thing about trust is you're trusting in something that you can't see. The trustful, you can't, you've got your eyes closed, and all you have to do is fall back. It seems so easy to do, yet so difficult. I feel like trying it with one or two people, but it's only the people that I would drop. <laughs> but you can't see behind you. You can't see what's going on. You're placing your faith, your trust, your hope in the people that are there to catch you. And so Hebrews chapter 11 tells us this. It says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. You will not have the whole picture, but God does. And sometimes what we do whenever we're going through these issues and these situations in life is that our focus is directly on that which we are going through instead of looking at the whole picture and trying to see the whole picture. And God sees the whole picture. So what you're going through right now will change because God knows what's coming next. That's why you can trust him. That's why you can put your faith in him. It's the things hoped for, things that you haven't yet seen, but God says it's there. You, you can't see it, but at some point, you're going to. You, you can't see it, but at some point, you're going to enter into that which I have for you because God has got a promise and a purpose. So do we trust him with the now? Do we trust him with what we're going through now that will take us into what he has for us in the future? Beyond Throughout Hebrews chapter 11, the writer of Hebrews gives a list of people who had faith in God, who had hope in God, who had trust in God. People like Noah, who God called to build an ark, to build this boat. That nobody had ever done anything like this before. There hadn't been rain before, certainly it hadn't been a flood before. And so Noah's building this thing for something to happen in the future that people haven't seen before. And yet Noah has faith to believe in God. And our faith will at some point be tested. Our trust will at some point be tested because here's the thing about trust. Trust cannot be learned in a classroom. Trust can only ever be learned through experience. You can sit in a classroom and you can learn about history, and you can learn about geography, and you can learn about so many other books just sitting in a classroom, but trust can only be gained through experience. There's a story, I think I've shared this before, I think I've shared this a number of times before, I think his name is Blundell. It seems like I shared this just last week, but maybe I need to share it again, of, of a guy who set up this rope at the Niagara Falls, and he, he walks across the tightrope across the Niagara Falls. One slip and the man's dead. And everybody, all the crowds are gathered and they're all cheering him on. This is amazing. Look at what this guy's doing. He's walking across a tightrope across the Niagara Falls. And then he gets a wheelbarrow and he walks a wheelbarrow across the tightrope and everybody's cheering. He's even doing it with a wheelbarrow. And then he gets a big sack of potatoes or something like that there, puts it in the wheelbarrow and wheels the wheelbarrow across again, the tightrope and everybody's cheering. Wow, look at what he's doing. And then he asks a question, do you think I could put a man in this wheelbarrow and push him across this tightrope and back again? Everybody's, yeah, you can do it, you can do it. Okay, somebody get in the wheelbarrow. Whoa. You go, you go, you go. You cheered the loudest, you go. And it's one thing to say, I trust. I trust in you. I build my life on you. And then something hits and all of a sudden, maybe not so much. Our faith and our trust will be tested. 
Abraham was given a promise by God, you're going to be the father of, of multitudes, of many. There's a nation inside you, Abraham. And then at some point, you know, it takes so long, Abraham thinks, there's a fly up here, demon fly, out in Jesus' name. Um, and, and Abraham was given his promise, but yet it takes so long for the promise to be born. And Abraham takes things into his own hands. We'll not go into that story today. But eventually, the son of promise is born. He's called Isaac. And then his faith is tested. Because God calls Abraham, he says, Abraham, take your son, your only son Isaac. Take him up because you're going to sacrifice him to me. And what does Abraham do? He goes. He lays out an altar with Isaac on the altar. He's going to sacrifice his son to God. His faith is tested. And in that last moment, a voice calls out from heaven. It's okay, don't touch the boy. But his faith was tested. Your faith will be tested. But everything, is, as I come to a close, everything that God brings us through, I think God's ultimate objective for every single one of us is that we come closer to him. God's only objective for your life, God's only overall mission and objective for your life is that you walk in deep personal relationship with Him. Amen. Nothing else. Deep, loving, close, personal relationship with Him. That's, he wants you. He wants you. He wants you to know Him. He wants to know you. He wants you to know him. And sometimes adversity are things that draw us closer to God. I was talking with someone at the start there and um, just talking about someone and saying, you know, who's going through stuff. They're not a Christian, but their family members are and saying this has caused them to think more about God, what they're going through. Sometimes adversity can do that, can draw us to God. And as Christians, allow the adversity that we go through to draw us closer to God because that's God's ultimate objective. It's just to be in relationship with you. God is so devoted to you. God is sold out on you, loves you so much, loves you more than you could ever know, is devoted to you more than you could ever know. And that was always his objective from the Garden of Eden to be in relationship with us. And I pray that our response to the things that we're going through will be, I'm pressing on. I, I don't understand it. I, do, I don't understand why, but I'm pressing on. I don't understand why, but I'm trusting. God, I, I would like to know why, but... If I don't, that's okay. I'm trusting you. Let me finish with this story. So there's a guy called Job in the Bible. Job had everything. Multi-millionaire in his day. He had everything, all the possessions that you could want. And it's all wiped out. In a second, everything is wiped out. Job is a God-fearing man. You can read a story in the Old Testament. And everything is gone. All his kids are dead. All his, everything is burned up all his possessions, all gone. All gone in an instant. Job's response, Job ends up really sick and covered in sores and boils and stuff like that there. And Job's response is, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I don't, I don't understand, God, why, why this is happening to me, but I'm going to trust you because you know what you're doing. And allow those things to draw you closer to him. It hurts. It's painful. It's hell at times. But what God brings out of that, what God brings you through, will take you into deeper places that you never dreamed possible. You can't learn about it in a church service on a Sunday afternoon or a Sunday morning. You can't learn about it in a classroom. You've got to walk through it but he walks you through to the next stage of your journey. And press on. 
and I trust him. I don't understand it, so I'm not going to lean on my own, my own understanding, but I'm going to trust him. And in all of your ways, acknowledge him. Pursue him. Follow him. And he will direct your paths. That blurry picture will become clear again. As you acknowledge him, as you pursue him, worship, study, pray, focus on him, the blurriness will become clear. 